Okay, good afternoon and welcome back to this um, interesting room. Uh, today's subject will be the runtime environment. You know you have your source code and you run it through the compiler. And you get not directly an executable file, but you get uh, compiled code, uh, usually called an object module. Compiled code. It is executable code, but it's not built into a complete file. And then you have a linker, which um, also is a program that, well, takes various things as input. For example, the runtime library. If you have a function like printf in C, or some other things that are supposed to happen when you run the program, uh, all of this will be built together by the linker into the actual executable file. And then you take this executable file, which I will draw as a box, because now it's an actual program, like the linker and compiler. And when you run this program, then all sorts of things happen. And that's what we'll talk about today, the runtime environment, when you run your program that you have compiled and linked. Before we actually start with that, we will <coughs> look at some terms that we need to understand uh, and agree among us what they actually mean. Uh, we know what the compiler and the linker is, but what about the procedure and the function and the function call and the function activation? So. Some terms, function or procedure or method. I will use these interchangeably, even though some programming languages make uh, um, a difference, for example, between functions that return a value and procedures that don't return a value, and methods that are part of um, an object-oriented class, and then uh, uh, you need an object to call that method. But what I mean is a, <coughs> a part of the program that has been given a name and that you can call from other places in the program. The function definition is part of the source code. That's where you write the function or procedure method and the code that uh, will be performed when it's called. And you have a function name, which may or may not be as simple as just an identifier. For example, if you have a method in a class, then you can have the same method name in different classes. So you might need to include the method name. And if you have overloaded functions, like in C++, you can have a function that takes a string as argument and another function with the same name that takes an integer, uh, <coughs> then the data type is part of the function name. You have the function body. Uh, which is the part that is executed. And a function call. And the function call is part of the source code, where you write that now I want to call this function. 
so if you have, um, let's write this in C or C++ or Java, or I think it works in C sharp too. This is a function called f, which takes an integer n as argument and returns an integer. And here between the curly braces, we have the body of the function. And let's uh, write a, um, a factorial function. If f equals 1, return 1. Oh, no, I don't have space here. Else, uh, or for result is set to n times uh, the factorial of n minus 1. And then we need to return uh, the result in the variable or. So, and end of the function body. That's the body of the function. Uh, you have a list of parameters, sometimes called arguments, sometimes called formal arguments, sometimes called formal parameters. Uh, what did I decide to? Do you mean f uh, equals m? Uh, if, uh... Oh, sorry, that's uh, wrong. If n equals 1. Try it and see what kind of message you get from uh, the C compiler. It might not give you an error. It might give you a warning if it's nice, but if it's um, f w would turn into a pointer to function, and then it would compare that to the address one. And as, as you know, C is made by programmers for programmers, and it expects you to know what you're doing. So if you want to compare the function with a number one, it lets you do that. It might give you a warning, though. Uh, anyway, back to this list of, let's say, formal parameters. As opposed, as opposed to what you actually then send to the function. But let's look at that later. Uh, if it's C, then this is the name of the function. And you have a return type. So formal parameters was something also. Uh, when you, in your code somewhere else, call this function, let's say f3 like this, that's the function call. Uh, when this actually is executed and the function is called uh, when the program is running, we call that a function activation. Activation. So there's a difference between the function call, which is part of the source code and the function activation, which is something that happens when you run the program. Even though sometimes we call that a function call too. This is the actual parameter, actual argument, actual parameter or actual argument. So you have formal parameters and actual parameters or actual arguments or arguments. So 
The formal parameters is what you write here, and the actual parameters is what you actually send to the function when you call it. So, when the function is activated, you get something that's called an activation record. I don't have space to write it there, so I'll write it up here. Activation record. And you remember, possibly, the call stack? Here we have the ground and then we build the stack upwards. And you know, a stack is an ordered <coughs> pile of things. So you can only put things on the top, you cannot pull away things from the bottom. Uh, as opposed to a heap, which is an unordered pile of things. If you have a stack of books, that's a nice pile of books. If you have a heap of books, then it's just a jumble. Uh, when you call this function, what happens? Well, an activation record is created. Here you have the activation record on the stack. Uh, you will probably not start your program by calling f, so you will probably have a main function if it's C or, or C++, uh, which is called first. So it would be a bit misleading to do it this way. So let's uh, try to make a more complete program. Here we have the main function. Uh, where I just put this uh, <coughs> function call f with argument 3. And when the program starts, then you get an activation record for main. with no local variables or anything. But when it calls f, you get an activation record for f. Here is the activation record for f. And you have two local variables in f. You have r. And also this parameter n works as a local parameter or a local variable that gets a starting value in the function activation. So you have r and you have n. And since you send the actual parameter or actual argument 3, uh, you put 3 there. Okay? So the execution goes in here, sees that n is not equal to 1, but <coughs> uh, we have an else part which we can run, and then we call f here again. So we get a new activation record. A new activation record, f, with r and n, like this. OK? And <coughs> the normal usual way of calling functions and, and handling these parameters is what we call call by value. So I have an expression there, n minus 1, and I don't send n minus 1 as an expression to the function that I'm calling. Uh, instead, I calculate this expression and send the result, the value. So call by value. And what is n minus 1? Two. 2. So from this activation of f, I send 2 to this activation. And now I have 2 there. And let's work it out. Not equal to 1, so get in here. And again, call f. So I get a new activation record for f, I send n minus 1, which is, of course, 1. And 
when we start executing this third activation of, N, uh, of f, uh, I get to this part in O, it is equal to 1. So I return, but first I calculate, uh, no, I return nothing, I haven't set anything, uh, so R doesn't contain anything. Uh, but I return here to the place where I called f. I multiply the result of f, which was 1, because I did return 1. Uh, so n times 1, and n equals 2. So 2 times 1 is what? 2, yes, thank you. Uh, and then I return or, so I return 2. Uh, to the same place in this activation and I get this 2 multiplied by n which was 3 which turns out to be 6 and then I return 6 to main. Yes? The poster on the board, the yellow multiplication. <laughs> multiplication. We <laughs> multiply numbers. A factor times a factor is a product. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Two times three. Two times three. Yeah, good. Yeah, I cheated. I looked at it. So, as you can see, we have the variable R and the variable N in several <coughs> copies, in several um, versions. Because we can have uh, several function calls of the same function, uh, several activations of the same function, uh, working at the same time. So you don't have one place in your program where the variable R is located, you have several. Because you have several variables R. And the result is just thrown away. We don't put it anywhere. And a good optimizer might possibly be able to optimize away this, except if it's C, then some other function somewhere else could call F, so we can't remove F entirely. Okay? We'll see later that we will have more things in this activation record than just these variables the parameters and the local variables. For example, you need a return address. When program execution uh, gets to the return statement or the end of the function, it needs to jump back to where the function was called from. So you need a return address in the activation record and possibly other things. Yes? How about when we talk about the tail uh, <clears throat> When you have tail recursion, when, we, we will look at that later, but yes, uh, we have optimization of tail recursion or, um, that when the recursive call is the last thing that happens in the function, then the compiler can optimize it away and basically do a jump instead of a recursive call. Okay. Uh, call stack and also called a control stack. <coughs> it's not a stack for calculations uh, such as you can use to uh, uh, calculate postfix expressions. This is a different type of stack, but it's still a stack. Uh, you have a stack pointer that points at the top of the stack. Stack pointer. Uh, you also have something we call the lifetime of a variable. And what is the lifetime of these variables? Well, it's while the, this function is activated. So the lifetime, for example, for this R is from when this function started working until it returns. And this R has a shorter lifetime and a longer lifetime. 
Uh, you also talk about scope of a variable, which is where in the source code it can be used, it's visible. So for example, R here has a scope that ends at the end of the function. We should also mention local and non-local. We'll look more at that later, but a local variable is of course a variable that's local in the function, like R and M. Uh, if we uh, have a variable outside in C, uh, outside <coughs> the function definition, then it becomes a, um, uh, well, the, form, the term is storage class extern, but it's, it's a global variable that uh, is not, not local in the function. Okay? We also have this heap I mentioned, the uh, less ordered pile of things. As you can see here, it is uh, cheap to allocate things on the stack. I mean, if I want a new R and N, I just move the stack pointer. Uh, which is usually a register in the processor, so I add uh, <coughs> however large an activation record is. So the stack pointer now points there, and now I have R and N. Very quick to allocate things on the stack, and quick to deallocate it. The heap, <coughs> well, what is the heap used for? Allocation, yes. So, for example, if you call in C malloc, or if you call new in C++ and Java and some other languages, uh, then it is allocated on the heap. And the heap is uh, much slower because you need to find some empty space where you can put this object, or this uh, area. Uh, <coughs> you might need to tell the operating system that I need more space. Uh, and when you later uh, delete this with free or delete, or if you have automatic garbage collection, then you have an empty space in your heap and you might need to merge adjacent empty spaces. So this can be really slow compared to just putting things on, uh, things on the stack. Okay, let's look at the memory space. Unless there are some questions about this. No. The address space or the memory space which is the memory address space. If you have um, uh, a 32-bit architecture, then you have a little more than four billion. That is a number four with nine zeros. or four gigabytes, or four gigabytes minus one as the final address here. And this does not say 46, it says 4G as in gigabytes. Uh, <coughs> this address space can be organized in different ways. It can also be either a virtual or an actual physical memory space. Uh, typical on normal computers nowadays, or phones, uh, you have a virtual address space. So these addresses have to be uh, translated to actual physical addresses in the computer, but assume a virtual address space. Then it's typically divided into several ports. Possibly like this. This is an, an example.
You have some parts of the program uh, and its data that doesn't change. The uh, executable code, the instructions for the processor. You have um, uh, constant data. For example, if I write this string in my program, hi, then, depending a bit on how you do it and what language it is, uh, then it won't change during program execution. So, code constant data, sometimes called the text segment. And on a modern computer, uh, this is typically marked read-only, so you cannot change this. Then you have static data. And that's not the same thing as constant data. Static data means just that uh, <coughs> the variables you put there will stay there and not move around during program execution. Your R and your N from uh, your uh, F function, those uh, existed in several versions and appeared and disappeared during program execution. But if, let's say it's C, and you write int G at the start of your program, then you will have a variable G space for an integer that is located at a certain place during your entire program's execution. Then we have the stack. The stack I showed you and a heap. And it's just an example that the heap is at the end and the stack is there. But this might be a useful way to put it because then the stack can grow towards higher addresses when you add new, um, new activation records and your heap can grow in the other direction uh, when you need to add new, uh, new space. And if you have a, a, a virtual memory and a paged architecture, then uh, these addresses might not exist for this program. So, they are created by the operating system when we need them. If you have threads in your program, then it gets a little bit more complicated because, you know, a thread has its own stack because it needs to call functions. So, then you don't have one stack. Then you have several stacks or One for each thread. Four threads. And you can have thousands of threads in your program. This means that the stack will be fairly small. It won't, as in a single threaded program where it could grow, uh, well, at least until it crashes into the heap, uh, <coughs> then you will have a fairly small stack. Maybe something like 64 kilobytes. Possible size of a stack. Unless you say something different to the compiler and the linker. Which means you can't put very large data structures on the stack. And you can't have very deep recursion. Uh, <coughs> if I in my function Uh, have a short array and I, let's say, 100,000 characters, which is not very much on a modern 64-bit uh, computer. You have uh, gigabytes of address space, and this is just 100 kilobytes, but it won't fit on the stack. So large data structures on the stack won't work. Don't.
Oh, if you look at the um, uh, lecture notes, I have my own lecture notes that I have on the web. You can, there are some programs that you can run to actually see on your own computer how big an activation record is and which way the stack grows. And how do you do that? Well, let's say you have a, <coughs> a variable like uh, your old R. And if you take the address of that variable, you get a pointer to that actual instance of that variable on the stack. And if you have a recursive function, well, you can take the address to the next instance of the same variable, which is on, in the next activation record, and see the difference between these two pointers. You know, the, uh, this operator gives you a pointer to a variable in C and C++. Okay, let's look a bit more in detail at these activation records. Something that is called the call sequence, which means in which order are things done when a function is called, or rather when the function is activated when we actually run it. Uh, We can have the same um, factorial function we had before. You don't need to write it again. Again, the same call stack or control stack that we had before. And when we, we have the main here, the main activation record, uh, and then we call call our function f. And as before, we need some things here. We need this uh, uh, parameter, n, and we need r. But we need some more things. Uh, one thing that we need <coughs> is to store away the state of the CPU, the content of the registers, and so on. And why is that? Well. When I'm working when I'm calling this function, there might be all sorts of things going on, and the CPU might have stored all sorts of things in registers. And when I start running this function, this function will also want to store things in registers and do all sorts of things. So when I jump back here, I want to continue this. This means that I need to store away registers and other uh, CPU state. And when I return, I need to restore it. And where do I put this state? Well on the stack, in the activation record. So registers and CPU state. It could be, I mean, it could be a <coughs> floating point, um, various floating point flags about how to uh, handle uh, floating point numbers, uh, overflow flags, and so on. including stack pointer and the program counter. And the stack pointer, you remember, it's the uh, a register in the CPU that points to the top of the stack. So we know how to find N and R. Uh, <coughs> and the program counter is uh, another register that points to the instruction in memory we are performing now. Because, well, it's a place in memory where the instruction is. And we need to store that because when we jump back 
from the next from the function that is called, uh, we need to go back to the old place. So restore the program counter register. You might have a control link and an access link that point to other records on the stack. And what is a control link and an access link? Well, in some programs, uh, some programming languages, you have um, nested functions. Void f. And you can have a variable, int x, and when you do something with x, well, the access link, if what x is this, well, it should probably be this one. So the access link tells us how to find uh, the uh, encircling other function to use to look up data. And the control link is a pointer to the, uh, the activation record for uh, the function that called this one. So I can go back and check it, uh, which, which function called this particular function. So you have a number of things in the activation record uh, besides just local variables and parameters. But back to this call sequence. Uh, where should we do the various things? Well, here, in the calling function, you need to evaluate this value because you use local variables here, if you, if, uh, you have variables here, and you send this to uh, the function. Uh, but let's say uh, storing away registers and CPU state. Well, where should that be done? Should it be done here? when we call the function, or should it be done at the start of this function, when we jump here and start executing this one? Well, obviously you need to store away the program counter so you can jump back. But registers, which, where should we store away the registers on the stack? Should we do it here? Or should we do it at the start of the function? I mean, the compiler needs to decide or know how to do this. So all functions in the same program, in the same linked together program, needs to uh, agree on who does what. The caller or the call function. And if you would decide, should, uh, I mean, both, we can do it in both places, but we need to decide one. And if you were to decide where to store away registers and other CPU state, would you do it there or would you do it there? Any comments? Beginning of the function. Why? Well, I, I agree, you, you, it's probably better to do it here. And one reason for that is that, okay, you have, this is one place in the program, but you can have a million function calls. So do you want to repeat the same code a million times or once? But uh, things like this could be done in different ways, and 
you have a specific call sequence, or in Swedish, Anrops convention, conventions about how to call functions. Uh, and sometimes different languages have different details in how they do this. So it might not be easy to uh, link together code written in, let's say, C and Fortran. Okay. Let us look at what I hinted at before, uh, this handling of non-local variables, because in the function g here, uh, x is not a local variable, so we have to find it somewhere. So is it this x, or is it maybe a completely different x? Uh, let's look at that, and also that you can have different ways of doing this uh, Hand, uh, finding non-local variables and other non-local names. Here we have a program in uh, I'm not sure it's exactly C but I think it's fairly close to actual C. You have a function f which also has a variable called a, and you set a to 2, and then you call the function g, which I will define below here. The function g also sets a to, uh, let's say, 3, and we have a main function which Surprise also has a variable, a variable called a. Which, let's give it a starting value of 1. And then we call first g. And then we call f. And that is our complete program. And the interesting part now is this A clearly A is not local in this function so we need to find it but is it this A or is it this A or is it maybe this A? This file scope. Say again? The file scope. The file scope one. Well depends on what type of name lookup you have. Uh, in C, yes, yes. But you can have different ways of doing this. So let's uh, get on with this. Um, let's continue with this example. Uh, you remember we have uh, the variable a that exists <coughs> in three places. We have three different a's. This global a, this a inside the function f, this a inside the function main. And when we use one, well, which is this a? And uh, as I believe it was you who said, that... Uh, <coughs> In, if it's actual C here, then it is the global one. Because we don't, um, C is a fairly simple language, we don't complicate things. If it's a non-local variable, then it has to be in global scope. It has to be this one. So the easiest way, global, I say global lookup, because when the compiler compiles this code, and decides which a is it I'm going to set to 3, it finds this global one. 
but you can do it in a more complicated way. And again, our call stack. And when the program starts, we uh, create an activation record for main with its A. And even before that, we also have the global A, which, as I said, it's a static variable. It exists uh, from the start of the program and until the program ends. And I give a starting value here to 1, 1. And then we call g here. Now, if we have correction, no way. Uh, how do I look up the variable a here? Well. As we said, global lookup, or you can have what is called dynamic lookup. Just follow this link to where was this one called from. It was called from main. So It was called from main, so it must be this A then. Okay, possible to do. Then uh, G returns, and now we call F. This means that this uh, activation record disappears, and instead in the same place, we put the activation record for f, which also has a variable a. And then f calls g. So we get a new activation record for g, because main calls f, which in turn is called g. And now we're back in g. But if we use the same type of dynamic lookup, which is where do we find A? Well, now it's this A. So depending on when this function was called, or from where it was called, so this A here can be either this one, no correction, this one, or this one, which is, of course, annoying. Because when I look at the code, I want to know which A we mean. And also, for the compiler to generate efficient code, it also needs to know which A is it. It is not um, efficient for the compiler to generate code that when the function is run, when it's executed, it has to look up and find A during execution. So we don't want dynamic lookup. Uh, we want static lookup. Uh, and in this case, well, what does it, what does it mean? We look at uh, the environment here in the source code. Uh, which A is it? And in this case, uh, the only A we have is this global A. So in this case, static lookup and global lookup is the same. But uh, we could have, as I believe I uh, showed earlier, uh, in some languages, not in C, but in, for example, some extensions of C, uh, we can have a function inside a function like this. And if I set A to 3, then again, static lookup, look at the source code. Which A can this be? Well, it has to be this one, even if it's not a global one. Which is 
easier for us as a program, for me as a programmer to work with, because I know which A it is. Okay, questions? Dynamic lookup is a bit easier to implement when you write an interpreter at least, but uh, complicated for programmers to work with. Good. Uh, next step. Yeah, I should mention the difference between call by value and call by reference. We talked a bit about call by value. So what is call by reference? Well, why does this swap function in C, which is intended to swap the values of two variables, why does it not work? This is called by value, yes. And then later in my program, I have a couple of variables. Let's call them A and B. And then I swap A and B using this call, assuming normal C, or actually C++, or Java, or C Sharp. I think it's the same in all languages, all, all those languages that look the same. Why does this swap not work? Because, well, <coughs> You have a variable called x, you have a variable called y, you have a variable called temp for temporary, and let's say you have one and two as contents, and then you uh, uh, copy x into temp, so now temp says one. I copy from y to x, so now x says two, and I copy from temp to y, so now this one says one. So why doesn't this work? Why doesn't it change, uh, swap the values of A and B? A Say again? A and B is not defined. Did, did I make a mistake somewhere? Oh, this. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. they, they uh, assuming it's C, they will have some value, whatever bit pattern happened to be in that place in memory. Yeah. So they will have some value, but let's give them the starting values one and let, or rather assign them like this. So now they have values, okay. But why doesn't swap work? Why doesn't it actually swap A with one and B with two. Yes? You need to pass it by reference. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, call, uh, call by value. As we said, yes, up here I have two local variables, x and y. And I, when I call swap, I send the values uh, one up here and two to y. And then I swap the contents of x and y. But a and B are not affected at all. If it's C++, then we also have call by reference. All I need to do to make this work is to put these ampersand uh, <coughs> characters uh, in the list of parameters. Then in C++, this means call by reference. So what happens then? Well, I will still have my A and B. And up here, I will still have temp. But now, 
X and Y are aliases for A and B. They are references to A and B. Uh, it might be implemented using pointers, but that is not, that is not necessary. So uh, don't think of these references as pointers, think of them as aliases. Now, this works because I copy x to temp, I uh, set x to y, I set y to temp like this. So now it works. So remember the difference between call by value and call by reference. In C, we don't have call by reference, so we have to uh, simulate this using pointers. We send two pointers to A and B, and then we can, from the function swap, follow those pointers and uh, uh, actually swap the values. Right, questions? Then we'll delete this. And <coughs> um, while talking about deleting things, let's go to um, things allocated in the heap. Let's say uh, we have a pointer. Uh, or rather, let's start with a um, struct, a struct called link, which has a value, which is an integer, and also a pointer to the next similar struct. So this can be used to build a linked list in C. You can have a uh, struct link first. So now you have a pointer variable called first. And you can set it to point to a link object. And by object, I don't mean necessarily something object-oriented. I just mean a place in memory. And if it's C, I use malloc to allocate an area of the size struct link. And over here is the heap. So we allocate some space here for a struct like this, which has uh, space for one integer and one pointer to another struct. So, and you know how to build linked lists, so I'm not going to write the code for this. I just, let's say we uh, have uh, continued building something like this. And I try to put these uh, <coughs> structs, allocated structs, uh, randomly, because nothing, tell, nothing requires the system to put them in, in order or anything like that. So here we have a pointer, and there we have probably a null pointer at the end, otherwise we don't know where the list ends. Okay? And what happens now if you do um, first equals first pointer. If you do this, what happens to our data? Yeah, here is my first pointer next. So this one, this address will be copied there. So this disappears. And is that I have a pointer there. Okay. What happens to this 
place in memory. Still it's still there. What can I do about it? Not much. Not much. Uh, we have what's called a memory leak. So this will stay here, not forever, but at least until this program ends and all its memory is reclaimed by the operating system. So that was a memory leak. If I uh, do um, free is the opposite of malloc. If I do free first pointer, if I do this, free first pointer next, what happens then? If, if it looks like this. Or at least the malloc system in, in this running program. Typically, freed memory is not returned to the operating system, but just to, to the pool of memory that this program uses. So, first point to next is now this one. So, I tell the system that you can reuse this for something else. So, it's the memory is still there, and until we have allocated something more, which may, may be done by some system function. Uh, it looks like we still have this memory, but it is not really reserved for us anymore. And this is sometimes called a dangling pointer. I point to something that's not really there anymore. So these are problems we get. Uh, with manual memory manage, management, manual memory management, uh, like we have in C. Many languages have automatic garbage collection. Uh, Java has it, C sharp has it, uh, C++ not really, Python. and Python has it, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Say again? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, my guess would be not. Anyway, uh, how can an automatic memory manager handle all this? Well, first of all, since it's done uh, by the computer, uh, we don't need to use these uh, uh, calls to free. We will never uh, mistakenly unallocate something. And since garbage, that is, memory is no longer used by this program, uh, is automatic, we won't have memory leaks. But how can the system do this? How is it possible for the system to reclaim memory that is not used anymore? Say again? Yeah, one way would be to use reference counters. And now reference is in the mean, means pointer. It does not mean reference as in C++. It means pointer. If we have a pointer, when we started here, we had this list. Uh, before I started moving things around, uh, I had one pointer to this, one pointer to this, and one pointer to this. And when I moved this pointer here to point there instead, then I will have zero pointers there, and two pointers there. And whenever I move or change a pointer that points to something, I need to update this counter that, and, and this counter uh, that keeps track of how many pointers I have to this object. And when I see that, oh, now this disappears, this uh, goes down to zero, then I can reclaim this object. And I have to do this in the code that moves the pointer. So the compiler needs to put out uh, code that handles this. This is uh, possible to do and fairly easy, but there are some disadvantages. And one disadvantage is that <coughs> whenever I move a pointer, I need to update this counter and in this case in two different objects. And you know, locality of reference is important in a program for, for speed. 
uh, caching and so on. I don't want to randomly change things all over the memory, which I will do <coughs> because when I move, when I change this place in memory, this pointer, I will need to change this one and this one too. And this will slow down program execution. So we usually don't use reference counting uh, in uh, a language that has a garbage collection. What we instead do is some version of mark and sweep. And let's look at how that works. Let's say garbage collection. And when I say garbage collection, I mean automatic garbage collection. We could do it manually by calling free lots of times, but here it's automatic garbage collection. Uh, and a note in Swedish, it's usually translated to skräp samling. Uh, a better translation is sophämtning. Trucks uh, <laughs> drive around the city and, and collect the garbage. Now, we have something that can be called the root set. Those are objects, pointers and other objects, that are not garbage collected. Because let's say if you have something on the stack. Here's one thing, there's another one. And here we have an object with a pointer. If you have things like this, uh, those, I mean, we don't throw away things, we don't remove things that are on the stack. Also, global variables. Let's see this pointer that points there, this one that points, well, maybe to this object. Uh, those are, first of all, directly accessible by the program. I mean, if you have the variable A, you can always use it in your program. It's directly accessible. And things on the stack is also directly accessible. If you have, this is the variable b in your running function, you can access b directly. And also, we don't want to remove them because uh, they should be permanent. So this is the root set. What you can collect where you can find the garbage. It's on the heap. So over here we have the heap. If you allocate something with, let's say, malloc, or something similar, uh, then you can have, let's say, b points there. Uh, this one points there, and then you have all sorts of pointers in here. All sorts of pointers. As you can see, these can all be reached from the root set. From B, you can go here. And from there, you can go on there. And from there, you can go on there. And then back. So all these objects are reachable from the root set. You could have some other objects here. Let's say these two. That are not reachable from the root set. Let's say we have uh, pointers like this and just to complicate things like this. Uh, <coughs> these can never be used again, because we have no way to reach them from our program. The only way to find things are through pointers from the root set. So these are not reachable, they are unreachable data. Or let's add a few more just to complicate things. These have some pointers back to reachable objects, but 
they are not reachable themselves. I have no way to get to these objects. Reachable and unreachable. I also have what is called dead data. And, of course, live data. What is dead data? Well, that is data that will never again be used in the program. And it's very hard to determine what data is dead and what is live that is not dead. It may depend on input to the program and, you know, the halting problem. There could be uh, parts of the program that we may or may not reach. So finding which data is dead is hard. However, finding which data is reachable, that is, if not easy, so are at least possible. Because I start with the root set. And which data can I reach? Well, where can I follow pointers? I can follow pointers to this object, this object, and this object from the root set, but not to the others. So what we do in garbage collection is that we look at which data are unreachable, and since they cannot be reached, we know they will never be used, so we know they are dead. And we remove unreachable data. And by the way, <coughs> to show one problem with references, reference counting, these two objects that point to each other in a cycle, or you could have more objects in a cycle, these uh, cannot be collected by reference counting since they point to each other. So the reference counter will never get down to zero even though we don't have a way to access them. Okay. How do we do this? Mark and sweep is the basic garbage collection algorithm, which means mark objects and then sweep up those that are not reachable. So what do we do? Well, first of all, a flag on each object. We need to put one single bit in each object. which we will use to show is this reachable or not reachable. So this object will have a flag, this object will have a flag, this 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 will have a flag. Set all flags to false. Now, this can either be done when each object is created, or we go through all of memory uh, to set the flags to false, to zero. The bit is set to zero. And then you might wonder, but these objects are not reachable. How can we go through all objects and set the flags if the objects are not reachable? Well, the system needs a way to reach them. If nothing else, we can start with the first uh, valid memory address and go through all memory. But typically, on the heap, you know which objects are allocated. For example, when you call free in C, you send a pointer to an object. So there has to be some way to know, OK, this object, how large is it? Uh, can I put it back in, when I free it, can I put this space back in the list of free spaces? And so on. So the system keeps track of the allocated objects. My program, which has this root set, cannot reach them, but the system needs a way to, to access each element. So I have a way to set the flags to false. And then 
comes the Mark phase. Recursively Mark from the root set. And what do I mean by recursively Mark from the root set? Well, start at the root set. Uh, follow all pointers. Now I get here, now I get there. Here I have one. I get there. I have one pointer there. Uh, I have one pointer there. Now I'm here. I have one pointer there. Now I'm there. And while doing this, mark all these objects. And when I, in this cycle here, get back to this object, oh, it's already marked. I don't need to go on in this circle forever. Uh, <clears throat> so I just follow all the pointers recursively and stop whenever I reach an already marked object. And I have another pointer here which goes to an already marked object. So the marking phase marks all reachable objects by reaching them. And sweep phase. Sweep up all unmarked. This says unmarked, you can't read it. Sweep up all unmarked objects. So again, we go through all the objects on the heap. And this is not marked, this is not marked, this is not marked, this is not marked. So I reclaim them. That is, <coughs> I um, know that when the next time malloc or uh, whatever way I have to allocate objects on the heap, when next time it's called, I can use one of these spaces. And incidentally, these two were reclaimed also. It doesn't matter that we couldn't use reference, reference counting to reclaim them, but mark and sweep can reclaim them. Okay? This is the basic algorithm for um, gar automatic garbage collection. Now, some disadvantages with this. One disadvantage is that while I am doing garbage collection, I don't want the program to continue to run and maybe move things around, move pointers around. So in the basic mark and sweep algorithm, I have to stop the world. This program may be running and doing various things in various threads, but I need to stop everything. And then garbage collect, and then we can continue. So <clears throat> for example, I had a, a program for an older phone that showed an animation and it moved smoothly and nicely, but once in a while it stopped and then it continued. And that was when the garbage collection ran. The garbage collector stopped everything. Uh, to avoid this, we have incremental garbage collection, which means you collect a bit at a time, a part at a time. So I go through, mark, but then I stop and let the program run for a while, and then I do something else in the garbage collection. So I don't need to stop the program. This, this also makes it possible to have a thread specifically for garbage collect. If I have uh, a CPU with, different, uh, with several cores, uh, one can run garbage collection and the others can run, run the rest of the program. Now, it gets complicated because I need to keep track of which parts have I uh, already marked, which parts have I already sweeped, and I can't let the program run um, uh, as, is, as simple as before. I need to keep track of, of uh, which parts I have already 
uh, handled by the garbage collector. So it's, it's a bit more difficult. But incremental garbage collection is possible and avoids these annoying stops. Also, one problem or another problem is that a program that's run for a while, let's say a web server, it's been up for a month, it has lots of data, and most of that data is fairly static. It doesn't change much. Configuration, databases, and so on. Uh, but I have some data that is uh, recently allocated. This particular web page request that we're working with now, well, that data, that data changes a lot. So garbage collection, if I do it using um, the basic Mark and Sweet method, uh, I will have to go through all the data, even those databases and configurations that were read into the system a month ago. And it's quite a lot of data that almost never changes. So it's a lot of work all the time that is not really necessary. So we have, to help us with that, we have generational garbage collection. And what is that? Well, we have all our old data, and then when I create new data, I put it in a so-called nursery, where we put newborn children. Uh, <clears throat> and that data is collected using garbage collection frequently, while the rest of the data, all those uh, huge databases from a month ago, are in the older generation. And we collect, we garbage collect that data more seldom. And when a data object survives uh, a garbage collection in the nursery, we move it to the older generation. So then it's considered to be older data. And in that way, we don't need to collect, uh, work with everything in our memory uh, during garbage collection. So generational garbage collection helps us with that. So it can be very efficient uh, using these uh, newer modifications of the uh, mark and sweep. Well, why? Why not just call free or delete whenever we're done with something? Because we're lazy. Because we're lazy, yes, that's a good reason. And programmers are expensive, so do we need to pay a consultant uh, uh, um, <coughs> fairly expensive hour fee to do this that a computer can do? Well, no. But it's also very difficult to do this. Why is it difficult for a human to get reclaiming of data object correct? Well, let's say you have a fairly large program with three parts. Here you have part one, part two, and part three. And they start allocating data. And of course, they uh, keep track of their own data. Here we have the root set for this. OK, this could be collected. Here we have the root set for uh, this. Here we have the root set for this. And then they send things back and forth to each other. So this one is sent over here. So here we have a pointer there. And here we have a pointer there. Here we have a pointer there. Well, now it's suddenly not so easy anymore. Uh, this part of the program, OK. I have allocated this and this. But this I no longer can reach, but it can be reached through this subsystem, part two here. And here, okay, I can reach this one, but when I remove this pointer, can I collect this? Well, yeah, I can collect it, but I have a pointer to it, but this one is not reachable, so yeah, I could really collect it, con uh, collect it and, and uh, reclaim it, but I have, well, it gets very difficult when you have a large program and 
shared data between different modules. So it's really difficult to keep track of all this for a human programmer. But computers are really good at keeping track of small boring details. So this is very much uh, something that a computer is good at. So garbage collection may be one of the best applications for a computer ever. Okay. I have another example for something called conservative garbage collection, which I don't have time but for, but I will at least notice that there is something called conservative garbage collection. And what is that? Well, all this requires that I have support in the language. I need, for example, I need some sort of type field here that says that this is a link record. Because when I follow a pointer to something, uh, all I find there is bits. If it's C, uh, I have lots of bits. I don't know if it's a plain number, just 32 bits integer. Is it a record with a number and a pointer? Or is it maybe a record with a number and two pointers? Well, I don't know that. To be able to go through everything like this in the marking phase, I need to know which things are pointers and which are not. This is not a pointer, but this is a pointer. I can't just look at the bits. So it requires that we have a language that supports garbage collection. And then I have my C program, which does not support garbage collection. But by, again, looking at those bit patterns I find and trying to guess which can possibly be pointers and which can't possibly be pointers, uh, I can guess if a thing is a pointer or not. And I am conservative in the sense of I'm careful. Whenever something seems to be a pointer, I assume it's a pointer. So if it points somewhere in the heap, then I assume it's a pointer. And now with 64-bit pointers, you have a really large address space. So the heap will be a small part of it. So it, will be, uh, it is feasible to, to do this. Uh, to just guess at which things are pointers or not. And then you will guess that this is not a pointer and you will guess that this is a pointer and follow it. If you guess wrong, well, you're conservative, so you should never guess that something is not a pointer when it could be a pointer. But uh, when something is an integer, let's say five, and you don't have anything that could be, uh, well, five is not part of the heap address space then uh, you, you can guarantee that it's not a pointer. Yes? If a, if a function calls a result of a calculation, uh, say a, it can be used some two numbers and then it makes that a pointer. Uh, yeah, well, you, you can defeat this. I mean, if you encrypt your pointers, yeah, yeah. then, then uh, you have... you Not really. Okay, finished for today. Oh, sure.